OK, I hope you've seen the previous video, the Bronstein versus David Sands video on the YouTube com Kings Crusher channel. If not, please review that game first. Uh, it's a prelude to this. This game between Gupta and Jones in the London Classic round eight was critical for deciding who would be the winner of the FIDE Open. It wasn't just the main Masters Classic with the top players in the world that had players over 2600. These two players playing on board one were over 26, 30, both of them. Go up to 2640, Jones 2635. There's been some rumours maybe Jones was a candidate, you know, at some point for a future uh, entry into the Masters section of the Classic, you know, to, to, to play, you know, the likes of Carlson. Some rumours anyway, I, I don't know how true they are, but um, playing black here against Gupta has had recent brilliant tournament results, apparently. This was absolutely critical. The top prize of the FIDE Open, £2,500. Uh, second prize quite good as well. Um, so the, the winner of this game would, would be in for the big cash prize, basically. Gupta playing white kicked off with D4, and Jones chose the King's Engine defence. And what was the system which Gupta elected? Well, it was the system of heavy prophylaxis, uh, very similar, in fact the same system, the Makagonov system, that Bronstein adopted uh, against Sands. So basically, in this position, not Bishop E2, which is like considered like old main line, but um, H3. There are various venomous systems against the King's Engine anyway, even in the Bishop E2, by the way. You know, Bishop E2, E5, uh, castles. Of course, there's the well documented, accelerated, you know, queenside attack with B4, the dreaded bayonet attack, which many people argue, you know, Anand was very unlucky to lose against Nakamura recently. But this this carries some venom as well. This simple move h3, which I thought was really designed to discourage e5, but apparently you know as I say e5 is playable anyway. Um, d5, okay, and after knight a6 again this nasty pin, bishop g5, and the pin is immediately broken out of actually with queen e8, and then we see again this idea of g4. So really, kind of clamping down on black ever playing f5 and this might be some sort of not just prophylaxis but also psychologically depressing for the black player that they're not getting in uh, their fun game of playing for f5 and later f4 it's completely different to the main line of the king's engine as i say there's various venoms against the king's engine white could also play the fianchetto variation and have a more solid than usual king position so even if f5 f4 occurs it's not that dangerous. Uh, but anyway, knight c5. And here we see a big change from the Bronstein game against Sands. Uh, the queen commits now to the c2 square. In the Bronstein game, we saw actually knight d2 with a very interesting idea of queen f3. So that was the you know one of the ideas of knight d2. But in that position, it's slightly different. The pin was actually more effective because the queen was on d8. Um, so maybe you know the queen could be a tactical target if if the knight could simply move and then f5 the queen might be a tactical target but queen c2 is again kind of prophylaxis anyway against f5 because it is looking at f5 from c2 in any case so this system looks like a bind on f5 with these two pawns it looks like a bind which is annoying i think for the king's engine player a5 reinforcing the blockade c5 outpost bishop e2 will white castle kingside or queenside that's the question bishop d7 and now bishop e3 just even like not even waiting for a weakness with h6 as though bishop c5 might be on the cards or is it after c6 in fact white now plays knight d2 just strengthening e4 a little bit and maybe you know just maybe uh, in some variations, this might be useful as well. This this backward to go forward uh, strategic manoeuvre. 
Um, queen d8. Now rook g1 really kind of you know psychologically saying if you ever play f5 I'm going to use this g file and the king is going to be in trouble. So um, okay, but also queen e8 means you know the, the knight can go back to e8 if g5 is on the cards. Otherwise there's not too many squares for the knight. Now the bishop's taken up d7 as well. Also the queen is often coming to b6 in some lines or maybe c7 if cd is about to occur. A4. And now, in fact, white delays casting queenside. It looks as though he's all set to castle queenside. In fact, he just plays h4. So how does black actually generate counterplay here? Well, a4 does facilitate queen a5, which would seem as though is the start maybe of some queenside counterplay, maybe cd and b5 at some point. But for the moment, the knight's attacked g5. Where does it go? Does it really want to go to e8? If it goes to e8, it's getting away of the connections of the rooks. Uh, but I suppose the knight could, after that, go to c7 and maybe again cd and b5 later. But um, a more dynamic approach is chosen by um, Darwin here. He plays knight h5, which you know it's like kind of fish in the 1972 match, offering double h pawns. Uh, but getting rid of white's light square bishop, which might be useful if black later, you know, activates this bishop, especially on this diagonal, it would seem dangerous if the white king is on c1. So there's a dynamic potential about this move to grab light, you know, the white's light square bishop. The challenge is accepted here. Um, you know, can white manage these tactics and the implications of that? He does give up his light square bishop. He takes on h5, and now. He plays a3. Rather curious move, but I guess it's some sort of prophylaxis against maybe the potential of queen b4 being annoying, maybe. Okay, and now, going despite this g5 pawn ready to do an en passant, uh to expose his king a little bit, he plays it anyway. You know, he wants maybe to activate his, his light square bishop. The en passant is used. Rook takes f6. Structurally, you know, White has potentially, you know, some weak pawns. You could, you could argue. Now White castles queenside. Rook a f8. Potentially, there's maybe an exchange sack on f2 here. Prophylaxis again. It's guarded against if that is really a threat, but it's also attack as well as defense now. Rook g2 because the rooks can also double across the, you know, to g7 and, and then maybe in the future this rook moves bishop h6. It's going to be dangerous. Bishop e8. The bishop's finding a diagonal, maybe as a striking point, attacking and also defending on that g file. Uh, now this backward retreat for strategic maneuver, you know, to go to g3 where it's eyeing both f5 and also that vulnerable pawn. Not so vulnerable if the bishop's on g6. One could argue. But now check: is the knight dangerous on b3? Not particularly at this point, it seems. Bishop g6. We should take an engine evaluation here of this position. It's quite complicated and rich, and a closed position. Um, let's let's check uh, from an engine point of view on move 24. It seems white slightly better from an engine point of view. Okay. Knight g3. And uh, there's a very like interesting idea coming up here that actually in this position after the rook moves uh, there that uh, white is prepared here to potentially sack a pawn uh, to try and in uh, intensify the king side operations and maybe win the e4 square for this knight um, you know, often getting a knight on e4 is very good news. So this move, knight f5 was played, probably expecting you know bishop f5, e takes, rook takes f5, knight e4 looks good visually, but there might be a more specific reason as well, like doubling the rooks and, and threatening bishop h6. If we just quickly examine this actually, just to make sure what what is going on here, if this this ordinary continuation, uh, just to explore this. The concrete rook dg1, forget the visual knight e4. Okay. 
And now black's in big trouble here. If he played rook f7, then bishop h6, uh oh. So very concrete actually. Forget about knight e4. Uh, black's in trouble on the g file if he did do that ordinary continuation. In fact, his move is recommended by Houdini. What he did do was sacrifice the exchange here. Um, so basically, rook takes f5, sacrificing the exchange, means that the bishop can always step back now to guard the g-file. It's also attacking the queen, screwing the queen. So this move, this visual move is forced, prompted knight e4 anyway. Okay, and now black strips open the c-file, so it looks all pretty good news so far for an exchange sack. He's averted the g-file disaster, he's got bishop g6, and rook c8 is also on the cards at the moment still, because the bishop's still pointing at c8 if rook c8 is about to be played before bishop g6. Um, but, okay, in this position, Gwaine played king h8. I wonder actually, is rook c8 impossible here? Possibly because of knight f6 and queen takes f5, it's not on. Let's just check that. Rook c8 is probably a disaster. Knight f6 would be a killing move, yes. King moves, queen takes f5, end of game. Which means, unfortunately, and tempo is, is pretty critical, that black's having to play this move to get out of that g-file pressure. So the knight is, as I mentioned earlier, visually it's good and often winning games uh, for white in the king's engine to get a knight to e4. So here it did make its uh, presence felt, uh, forcing black to lose that tempo. And now it's supported, actually, which means the queen is now free uh, to go now that it's supported. So rook c8, using the bishop on c8 anyway, to kick the queen, but the queen's now free to go. It goes to e2. Okay, so if there's any capture on e4, the queen's already got an attacking point of h5. Queen, the black queen now goes to c7, and now the pressure starts to mount on the g-file. Rook dg1, the bishop fends off the g-file pressure for the moment. But now an exchange sack by white. So there's lots of exchange sacks in this game on board one. Uh, so please don't moan in my blitz videos, please. When I when I do exchange sacks, they're just a natural part of the game, just to do with you know king safety and piece quality interchanging all the time, trying to prove the value of pieces in particular positions, going beyond the normal token values. So here it seems rook takes g6 was on. Okay. Um, I, f I detect there's a nasty idea though of queen c1 check and mating on a1 if uh, the routine <laughs> recapture rook g6 was used here. Now let's just, just check that. I think rook takes g6 might not be the best move in the position here. Uh, in fact mating free yes comes up, queen c1 check, uh, rook takes c1 and, and the knight's actually justifying itself quite well on b3 here, sporting this mate. So that's to be avoided. The idea of the exchange check is not to immediately capture on g6. Okay, but to play queen g2 as played, queen g2. The queen's uh, going to crash through it seems on g6. If queen f7, unfortunately, uh, d6 seems to be on here embarrassingly. Knight takes d6. Looks pretty unpleasant. So in this position, actually, Gwaine has difficulty defending g6. It's a real pain. He plays rook f8, allowing g6 to drop. And h5 is now on, so that's defended by queen f7. And I know d6 is on here as well, but... Um, White uh, kept the queens on with queen uh, g5. So d6 is on. If the queen takes an f3, there's queen g7, mate. The queen's tied down. Queen g8 doesn't look like the most healthy, aggressive king's engine move in the history of the king's engine. Queen g8. Queen takes h5 check. Queen h7. Okay, there's a pin. Uh, but this dominant knight is not something a king's engine player generally likes to see a knight on e4. Queen g4, and now things like h5, h6 look unpleasant, to say the least. Knight d4 was played. It was snapped off. Okay, temporarily giving the bishop an extra square, but doubling the pawns. 
And the king comes out of the pin. The knight's now free to move and take on d6. d3 was played. The knight did snap the pawn on d6. So taking stock, stock of the situation, this hasn't been going well for black. Um, black, unfortunately, he's two pawns down. His bishop's got scope on the diagonal, but he's two pawns down. Uh, this this pawn, unfortunately, doesn't seem to be that heroic at the moment, nor does the queen if it's tied down to the bishop. Uh, bishop e5 was played, and now queen e6. Okay, bishop f4, as though maybe d2 is going to be useful on queen c2, if black's given one or two moves. But knight e4, that blocks the queen's path. Also makes way for white's d pawn, queen f5. And now a nasty tactic, rook g8 check. The rook can't take without losing the queen. King h7. And now exchange of rooks and knight f6 check. Okay, um, king uh, g6, knight d7 wins the queen. So king g7 is practically the only uh, move here. If, if king h8, then queen f5 looks like a double attack on f4 and h7, threatening mate. So king g7, but it looks pretty dire here. Queen g4 check, and now Gwen resigned. Gwen resigned. He's faced, unfortunately, um, with a lost king and pawn ending here. Uh, let's let's follow this through of what could have happened. So say takes, takes, takes the queen. This pawn's dangerous, but the king can just step in here, leaving white with seemingly totally one king and pawn ending king just comes there rounds up the pawn we've got two past pawns here it's totally hopeless it was a depressing king's engine game um so if if i've tried to make the king's engine look entertaining and fun recently um beware beware there are a lot of nasty systems against it and this is just one of many this kind of heavy prophylaxis system no fun black attacks, no king on the king side. This is the harsh, br brutal reality uh, of chess. And if you're going to use the king's engine to try and win tournaments, it's sometimes a bit dodgy as well, it seems. Um, so, uh, heavy prophylaxis against black ever playing f5. And also, you know, use for attacking intentions. Um, I guess one could say, well, you know, what if, what if knight e8, you know, hasn't white blocked the lines? Isn't knight e8 possible here instead of knight h5? We could check it out briefly, actually. I should have perhaps done that before. Knight e8 might be one of the better moves. No, no, it's switching between knight e8 and h5, actually, Houdini. And it gives this a bound around about equal. If there's an improvement here, maybe it is knight e8, in fact, in this situation. Knight a8 is given the slightly better for some reason, some mysterious reason looking at millions of positions behind the scenes. Um, so h5, the knight can go to c7. Now would white really close up the position? Doesn't seem in the spirit of it, but it does block in the bishop here. And maybe, um, okay, what's going on in this type of position? Maybe this is safer than the game anyway. You see, in the game, that pawn was a target for this rerouting knight to come to g3. So maybe this this was an improvement, uh, according to Houdini, on very brief analysis to knight h5. So knight h5 is perhaps more committal. Um, okay, no one likes a bishop on h8, but if the king's kind of safer and then black's got potential play on the queen side with the rest of the pieces, then maybe that was a better bet. So as it was... Um, you know, double exchange sacks interchange from both players though uh, really spices the game up dynamically. Uh, so coming up, but the prelude to that is is this very powerful looking knight f5. I think it took away a lot of the dynamic potential which had been um, optim optimistically anticipated by Gwen Jones. So a lot of the dynamic potential being taken uh, from black. White just about holding on to that d5 pawn. The rook on the castle position, queen side, just happens to be protecting d5. Otherwise, d5, that would be pretty bad to lose. Uh, so everything's just been held on by white here. And rook c8, not possible because of knight f6. 
So it seems unfortunate and working like clockwork, also white strategy, that F3, and now the Queen's free to move. And now the doubling of rooks can take place, the counter exchange sack, without falling for a Queen C1 cheapo, just playing calm Queen G2, and the attack from here on in seems to be crashing through quite dramatically and brutally, to be honest, with a supporting beautiful knight that a lot of players would dream of, of having as white in the King's Engine. So it was a brutal game, so one of the top quality games of, of the Philly Open in terms of both players being over to like 26-30 rating. Uh, so it could have been like a you know a classic game, uh, potentially, in terms of rating. So check, and it's a brutal finish to, to tran transform into a winning King and Pawn ending. So um, yeah, some of you are going to be completely put off with the King's Engine as I do more videos about the D5 structure. But as I say, I, fi I find the closed positions quite fascinating strategically. Um, so please excuse some of my game choices. Comments or questions on YouTube? Thanks very much.